So uh, our final presentation of the day is by uh, Wynne Schwartau, Chairman of Mobile Active Defense. Uh, it is entitled, What Scares the Living IT Out of Me and Keeps Me Up at Night. Please welcome Wynne to the stage, please. been a hell of a conference and one of the great things for me at these is getting to see folks that I only get to see every couple times a year when we run around and do networking and that's where I actually get most of my learning done and people provoke my ideas and thinking into areas that uh, I normally uh, don't have an opportunity to do and especially at last evening's uh, parties number one through eleven a lot of provoking thoughts went back and forth so I threw a couple of those into here and what we're going to talk about is what does scare the living IT out of me and some of the thoughts that I've got with regards to where we're going and what first of all keeps me up at night well never mind on that she told me not to put that one up <laughs> biggest thing that bothers me is nobody gives an IT about what a lot of what we're doing they don't care they don't understand how important it is and how long we've all been trying to get these things done, putting ideas forth and doing the warnings over the years. Many, many years ago, we were talking about the weaponization of the internet. And I remember very, very clearly uh, talking with Congress back in 1991 and describing some of the issues that I was worried about coming down the line. And the congressman uh, asked me, he says, Mr. Schwartow, do you really believe that the bad guys are ever gonna use the internet for something evil? And we all know many of the struggles that we've had over the last 20 years, getting people to pay attention. And it's always a surprise what the bad guys come up with. I, I remember back in 2001, or maybe it was 2000, that little Canadian kid, mafia boy, and that DDoS attack. And I remember I was at a, one of my clients, and it was like, wow, that's really evil. But wow, that was really cool at the same time. A great abuse of technology that we really didn't foresee and became, and now certainly is, a very, very significant component in the arsenal of various of the attack methodologies that are being used, and especially being used in various types of APTs as well. So a lot of the things that were predicted 20 years ago are part of our daily life today, and unfortunately, we ignored a huge amount of it. No political comments here, but when you have a mass of lawyers running things that do not understand what's going on under the hood, you have a problem. Do you hire an electrician to fix your plumbing? Do you hire an IT guy to repair a carburetor for those of us that have old cars? Need some of the right people in the right places, and it's something that we collectively at the government level, and especially in this government body, we've had some trouble with. Having the right people with the right advice, doing the right things, and now we're 20 years behind. So some of the problems and things that really, really bother me, I'm gonna weave in and out of, and uh, again, what I'm saying up here, I do not want anybody to believe and accept everything I say. All I ask is that you consider it and discuss it amongst yourselves, amongst the community, amongst your colleagues here and around the country, and perhaps there is some value in some of the things that I'm looking over the next, at the next 20 years for. We've done an awful itty job of doing defense. We have not done a great job. I've had to be very careful in some of the lettering on this presentation, because I put it together about seven this morning. And when we keep doing the same thing over and over and over again and expect the same results, we're kind of ending up where we are. And this is not a surprise to those of us that have strong engineering backgrounds, but it's sometimes a surprise to various types of policymakers that don't have the type of skills, that don't have the type of backgrounds that we have when it comes to making things work and being willing to make significant, significant changes where they're really needed instead of trying to band-aid them with some new minor change to what's going on. The concept of fortress mentality still exists, and it astounds me that it really exists. We talk about perimeterization and firewalls 20 years ago with Cheswick Bellavan, and now we've talk, talked about deperimeterization, and now the mobile thing, okay, that's the new endpoint, but the endpoint is really being redefined in that the carbon unit 
is the end point. The carbon unit is a significant component of what has to become this amorphous perimeter that is moving all around the world, connecting all of our networks together in ways that we do not even begin to understand, much less can we map. If you can't map it, how do you defend against it? And the concept of fortress mentality is one that even becomes less relevant the more and more mobile we become and the more and more involved the carbon unit becomes a very significant component of our, one of the layers of defense. I'm scared of China. Politically incorrect, hell yeah, but I'm calling it out for a couple reasons. They listened to us 20 years ago. They listened, their government listened. I know I've had a conversation with many of you that, remember September 8th, 1998, unrestricted war. And some people believe that they actually declared war on the United States that day, declaring that the civilian infrastructure and economy of the United States was a legitimate target of war. What did we do? Not much. China looks 50 years ahead. We look the next quarter ahead and pray for profits. We look for immediacy, a society of instant gratification that is not going to work in the long term long-term views and a willingness to do things and operate in an asymmetrical manner is something that we have not yet had the will to do, and we'll talk more about that. 20 years ago at the Pentagon, we were talking about at what point does a cyber event, a cyber offensive action, be term, become necessary to have a kinetic response? Now it's on the table, 20 years later. This bothers me. And it bothers me that the wrong people are actually thinking about it. And these kinds of decisions of where do you do appropriate levels of escalation or inappropriate levels of escalation from cyber to kinetic, and how do you control these types of events from getting out of hand? The discussion, in my opinion, has not been open enough. 20 years ago, it was in some inner walls in the Pentagon, and now there's a couple of uh, panels that have had some discussions, but it is not public to the degree that it should be with the potential danger for escalation. The over-reliance upon technology. When I checked into the hotel at DEF CON, a couple hours in Vegas uh, last week, a couple of hours later, they couldn't check in anybody because the registration computers came down. And for some reason, they had no pens, no pencils, and no manner at all to be able to registered desks. So the line became four and a half hours long. When we're looking at the systems we're building, whether they're mission critical or they're entertainment or any of the things that we're building, the amount of over-reliance that we are building into society, we can't live without it. I met an old friend from 22 years ago. She and I did a road trip. And we were talking uh, earlier today. Said, how did we make phone calls? And she said, oh, that's right. We ended up in a really bad neighborhood in South Chicago, and you were trying to protect me as I got on a payphone looking for where we were going before fax machines. But now today, we've got all of this stuff, and we rely on it, and it becomes to the point we cannot live without it. How far can an organization go in a matter of time without the technology? How long can the individual live without the technology? But more importantly, when these systems are designed, is there a graceful means of degradation to provide some minimal amount of services in order to then be able to start building some level of reconstitution? And I argue from what I've seen, we are living in a binary world. We're thinking in a binary world. It's on or it's off. There is nothing left in the middle. And I think that's wrong. I think that we really need to start looking at these systems as we escalate them, as we build new capabilities into them, with more of an analog mindset than we have. Cloud burst. A lot of debate about this. They say if you say cloud these days, you could raise $50 million out in San Francisco. So we're moving everything to the cloud, but it seems to me we're moving awful damn fast to a new model, a new architecture, and we haven't really properly solved some of the ones that we've already got, yet we're going to extend what we've got that's already broken into an entirely new architecture that we're only beginning to understand the implications of, yet we're back to that issue of over-reliance. 
we're going to over rely upon the simplicity, the apparent simplicity of the cloud when it works. But what happens when the cloud or some portion of the cloud breaks? What are we going to do? I haven't seen enough work in this area yet to be satisfied or really convinced that this incredibly rapid migration into this space and these modalities is what we want to do. Makes me somewhat uncomfortable and it's one of the things that scares the living IT out of me. Cyber war is going to move to the mobile phones. The Pentagon, I've talked to the generals and a bunch of these guys over the years, and they're going to have billions and billions of endpoints now to defend against. They're going to have billions and billions of new potential hostile points shooting at them, shooting at us, whether it's in the civil side or on the military side or on the government side, with an entirely new set of rules, a new set of capabilities, and new sets of vectors, yet we're still trying to solve the problems that we talked about 20 years ago. And I'm not hearing enough about how does 20 billion of these devices by the end of this decade so really affect the national security and ability to deliver mission critical services in both the private sector and the public sector. I don't think we've talked about this enough and the discussions that I'm hearing and the, some of the solutions and things that I'm seeing out there are the easy way out and it's making the same mistakes all over again and I hope, had hoped by now that some of us and perhaps at the higher leadership levels, would have been smarter than that by now. But I think they haven't. Herf and EMP, I, uh, Doonesbury did a cartoon about me oh, 15, 18 years ago on this, and I was talking about high energy radio frequency stuff and potential EMP, but nobody inside the DOE I mean the, and the DOD, no, no, that's all classified stuff, you can't talk about it, yet I had buddies building it. Poor man terrorist kinds of stuff. The technology as it migrates, just from the last 20 years into what's available publicly today, even without worrying about what's on the International Arms Bazaar, what can be done, and where is this going to be headed over the next several years? These types of devices have perhaps just localized effects, but lots of localized effects can have very damaging cascade effects. And cascade effects then go back to the over-resiliency upon the technology and back to the issue of can I gracefully degrade and have some level of survivability until the damage is mitigated. We have not looked at all the possible attack vectors with enough due diligence. And this is going to be another one that we're going to have to deal with. Out of DEF CON, I saw some of this technology. Guys were building remote interception eavesdropping and surveillance helicopters for under a hundred dollars. Cool stuff. Really cool technology. But what does that do for data exfiltration? What does that do to our otherwise perhaps pristine listening environments? And when the technology is miniaturized, when the work that DARPA is currently doing with bumble bots and little flying uh, devices for surveillance, when those suddenly become commercialized over the next several years. How is that going to affect the integrity of DLP for us? And I don't think we've looked at that enough. Some of you may have read the, uh, it was a thing in, I think it was the International Business Times. And in Germany, a number of companies now, whenever there's a meeting, they have a big coffee can or a cookie tin sitting on the conference table. Everybody takes their cell phones and their pagers and everything, dumps them in, and they close it. There are no electronics allowed in these meetings for the obvious reason of the power and capability of the mobile devices. Now I got a fly running around the room. Is that a surveillance fly? Is it a swattable fly? Is it organic? What is it? The miniaturization things, and we're not even going to get into the nano issues at this point, because that only exacerbates it even worse. I worry about this stuff because we've done such a poor job of getting to where we are and ignoring some of the real problems that we've got. Ultimately, every technology we deal with is going to be weaponized, and it's something that really scares us. Culturally, we don't like that. We want to believe that this stuff is all great and going to help us and be very, very useful. And yes, it's probably a really cool idea that your refrigerator can call your car to tell you to pick up milk on the way home. That's great. 
But now how do I abuse that? How do I take advantage of it? Or do I have to go to back to Congress's opinion and saying, why would anybody ever want to interfere with that? Because they can. Because they can is where you begin. And somewhere along the line, they're going to find a financial or ideological mechanism and reason to take advantage of it one way or another. But then now we have to also not look at the technical issues because we keep trying to solve so much of this stuff through technology and we ignore what's really at stake here and that's humanity. So this is what we're giving people. This is the computer we give them to operate. And we give them flight school training, don't we? Every, every one of our users is thoroughly trained. Show of hands here. How about one hand? This is what we're giving our users. This is all that the user needs. We are overcomplexifying their universe and overcomplexifying our job, making all of these other issues I'm talking about even more difficult to solve. Because every bit of technology we add that's good and cool adds another layer of complexity that involves that carbon unit somehow, whether it's maliciously or ignorantly, they're going to screw it up. So we need to look at four-letter dirty words. What does this picture, what four-letter dirty word does this picture mean? Shout it out. What, nuns? <laughs> what? User. There you go. Users. It's one of the dirtiest four-letter words in the security language I know. And again, back to the complexification, the simplification issues, have we engaged our users, whether the business enterprise user or the home user? Have we engaged them enough? Or are we just, as I mentioned when we began this on Tuesday, we're just maybe asking entirely too much out of them. And then that's not on them, that's on us. That's on us. Now the next really, really dirty four-letter word, what's it? What does this picture represent? Who said that first? There you go. I got more if you got it. Come up and get it. Root. And this is something that astounds me, to this day astounds me. In many businesses, well, let, let, let's say it's home. Let's say it's home. How many of you, and be honest with a show of hands, when you have to write a check, a personal check at home for more than, oh, say $1,000, both you and your spouse have to sign? So you trust your spouse with your life and your money. Businesses do it all the time. Over 5,000, over 10,000. But root control of our systems is what? One person. Evil. <laughs> Evil. Another good four-letter word. Give her a give her something. Root control. How is it for the past 30 years we keep designing systems that have no industrial control process feedback loop to monitor the watchers? Our technology is fundamentally designed with something that you and I know should not be there, and that's trust. Do you trust your admins? Do you trust your people with the keys to the kingdom? And to what degree do you? Our technology suggests we trust them implicitly. The reality is, the majority of the serious mistakes that go on involve an insider, one way or another, that has had probably entirely too much trust. And this brings out the issue of insiders. And I am a huge fan of profiling. We all, everybody in this room, loves to profile. We love to profile technology. We do it all day long. We look at network traffic. We look at spikes. We look at CPU behavior. Some of the booths down there and the vendors have got, compare this, I bring in this data, got this data, and now I got this piece of information I otherwise never would have noticed because I'm monitoring everything. And therefore, I'm profiling. I'm profiling and setting the thresholds according to my acceptable levels of risk. And that works. 
but we're terrified to do the same thing to people. We're terrified to do it because it's politically incorrect and the damn lawyers are telling us we can't. Can't ask you what your sexual orientation is, can't ask you if you're married, can't ask you what your religion is, and there's a whole mess of things I cannot ask you. But some places in the private sector, and certainly some places in the government sector, do use psychological profiling. We want to understand, if I'm giving you root control of a massive piece of my network and my organization, I want to know your tendencies, your proclivities. I want to know your weaknesses, your hot spots. I want to look for deception or what is going to trigger you to operate and behave in a deceptive manner. The same way that European security at airports works that we've not adopted yet. Every single user, a flyer in Europe is profiled before you can even get to the ticket counter. And they don't do it on color, they don't do it race creed, they ask you a few questions looking for deception. With the carbon unit being an integral part of our networks today, why aren't we doing this? It's simple and it works and we're terrified. The lawyers are the ones who are telling us how to do things. You can do this, you can't do this, but it's mostly you can't do this. I remember when the Pentagon got attacked by, a, attacked, very loose term here, uh, by a group of uh, early rebels, cyber rebels back in the 90s, and they shot some hostile packets uh, to some web browsers, uh, some web servers at the Pentagon, and the Pentagon knew about it because this was like one of these open attacks, kind of like the things we're seeing now, but this was way early days. And the Pentagon said, oh, we're ready for this. So their early cyber warrior guys had a couple of responses, and it was called hostile applet one, hostile applet two. So bad packets come in, they shot back all the hostile, the hostile applets back and defused the entire situation technically very, very quickly. The lawyers got involved. And they were all called on the carpet, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this. And the majority, in the private sector of what I see, and I gotta believe from a lot of the conversations I've had with many of you, the same thing in the government, you're operating on risk aversion. We're not operating on risk practicality. It's how likely are we to get sued? And what is a judge and jury gonna do as a result? To hell with practicality, what makes sense? Just because we're running the country and the world with technology, screw the rules we might get sued. For the lawyers in the room, I'm sorry, but there's too damn many of you involved in my business, in my field, in the field I've loved and dedicated three decades to. And as soon as we can find a way to get rid of some of them, please move on and let us do our jobs. And a key component of that I mentioned on Tuesday. I can remove a knife from a mugger, I can take away a gun, I can fight you back in the street with even lethal force if required and if I feel my life is in danger. In the cyber world, it is still completely illegal for me to disarm my adversary. That's downright stupid, period, stupid. Because we're back to the binary response. If I'm under sufficient attack and I'm prohibited legally, from disarming my enemy, what's my option? A binary shutdown response. That's about my only choice. Give us the tools, allow us to use the tools with appropriate amounts of proportional response to get our jobs done. Now to take this just a little further and a little weirder, if none of this is weird enough for you, thinking forward numbers of years, and a couple of things that are gonna be happening that I don't have any answers for at all, and I'd be happy to have a beer and discuss it with anybody, but the singularity. How many of you thought about the singularity, the rise of the machine? According to Ray Kurzweil, 2035, silicon devices will have the same level of intelligence as we do once they figure out how all the neuronal networks work and all the connections. How is that gonna affect us operationally? How is that gonna affect us security-wise if we can't deal with the human element now and now we've got a 
artificial human intelligence level capability suddenly tying into everything, has anybody really thought about the implications of this versus having Terminator, Sky, Skywatch kind of things coming along? This is something that we need to start thinking about sooner than later, and I think waiting 20 or 30 years to start thinking about it will be another drastic mistake if we allow ourselves to do. The next couple of years, Carrington Effect, 1853, huge solar flares shut down the entire telegraph system of the United States, and it was up and down and up and down for a period of nine years. Now we go back to over-reliance on technology, no ability to do graceful degradation. How do you disconnect? How do you reconstitute? And so sometime they're saying, and I'm relying upon NASA's figures and all these kind of guys that are real, really smart, solar flares are going to get pretty outrageous sometime in the next couple, three years. How many of you have plans to deal with the potential complete massive outages that can happen depending upon where the Earth is facing, the time of the day, time of the week, system loads, and when you look at the scale of the size of the Earth to these things, it should give you an idea that we started, better start thinking about this. And I'm not trying to create Y2K level hysteria, I'm trying to create a little bit of awareness for back to some methodology for potential ways to gracefully downgrade, gracefully disconnect, remove loads in order to be able to defend against what is likely to be coming down the line, yet is still considered science fiction. And I think the more that we ignore the science fiction issues, the more damage is going to occur because according to the movies from War Games 1984, Sneakers 1991, we today are living the science fiction of 20 and 25 years ago. And I don't think we should forget that. I think we, as a community, we're the smart ones. We should be starting to really make people aware and come up with some serious plans to deal with when these events occur. Then at the end of the day, it's the unknown. A friend of mine, Marcus Rain, and he made a great quote. He says, I know how to secure a network right now. I know how to secure a firewall. I know how to do all this, but I do not know what to do about the unknown. That's why I referenced Mafia Boy. Then botnets started coming out, and the bad guys starting to get very, very creative. See, we collectively are structured for a defensive mindset, not an offensive mindset, which is why on Tuesday I said, we need to hire the people you can't hire because of their lifestyles. They're the creative ones that are going to come up with the stuff that are going to help us predict what the bad guys are going to be doing because they think alike. Turn on the offensive capabilities. How screwed up can I make things? Ideological reasons, financial reasons, whatever it happens to be. We need these people to start helping us think about the unknown, the things that, because we're still reacting to yesterday's problems. We haven't solved yesterday's problems, and we've got a lot of new ones coming along. My job is to think about these kind of things. Come up with some answers, maybe. Offer something controversial, not popular. Definitely not politically correct in many issues. But this is reality. We're living the reality that we chose to ignore as a country 20 years ago. Now we're paying for it. We're paying for it big time. And I really hope that we make a decision as a community and as a country to stop thinking that way and decide to take some real proactive responses and thinking so we don't have to go through things that are going to make it any worse. Key components that we have to deal with, capabilities. This country is awesome at putting together capabilities. We've shown that. Thinking differently, we can do some of that. Do we have the will to implement it? Are we willing to go asymmetric? Are we willing to do the things that a lot of people are going to hate because it's the right thing to do? Are we willing to do it and do we politically in this country have the will to allow us to do our jobs the way that we think that they ought to be done? So with that in mind, this has been an awesome conference for me. Hope it's been an awesome one for you. 
Hopefully these are a few thoughts that are stimulating enough, and again, don't accept them all on face value, but please accept them enough to make them worth discussing. Thank you very much. I'd be very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you.